Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and today I am joined by Arthur, Arthur, not author, author, <laughs> futurist, uh, video game designer, Kimberly Unger. She wrote Nucleation and, um, and, and is just recently um, releasing um, a new book, right? Like uh, just a few days ago? Yeah, The Extractionist. It just the came out on the 12th. Cool. And, and, and just to jump right into it, what, what is The Extractionist about? So The Extractionist is a, uh, it's a cyberpunk thriller. And it's about uh, a woman who's, you know, sort of been knocked off her specialty in technology. Mm. And she's had to uh, enter a form of the gig economy in order to, uh, to get herself back to where she wants to be. And, uh, with, and this as is with some, all such things, it goes off the rails very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and this is actually very interesting. Is this a kind of like a futuristic or, or or like a kind of a 10 minutes from now version of the gig economy? Or is it or, or does it take place kind of grounded in our current sort of reality? It's you know, it's a it's a you know, 10 minutes into the future kind mm. of scenario, but it's you know the while it's inspired by sort of the gig economies that are popping up, it's it doesn't tie into our sort of our current versions of it uh, quite directly, right? It's a little yeah. more freelance, a little less gig, but it's you know a, it's a pro who had to go out and set up their own project. And, and, and I'm fascinating by that by by um, by authors who write novels. I'm actually getting uh, Andy Weir on here. Um, um, in a week who wrote the Martian, you know, and like, I love having authors on the show because I have experience writing for, for, you know, for video games and I have experience writing for the screen, but you know, it's kind of a shorthand version of writing, right? Like you're more focused on like the, the sort of visual representation of what's happening, the high level story points and the dialogue. Right. So, so it, it, it's its own kind of animal as opposed to a novel I mean, like a novel is like um it's like a fever dream, right? Like like you're in you're in all the way. What what's your process like when when you start to like say, okay, I'm gonna write a new book? So, you know, I always start with the first chapter. Like mm. that's my my from from my process. I have an idea, I give it a chapter, and then that tells me whether or not it's gonna it's gonna happen. Without right. without an outline, without kind of like you have something in your head, but you say let me just go and, and see the first chapter. Exactly. And then I build out the rest rest of the world that that chapter can live in. Mm. So, you know, that first chapter helps me set where the technology needs to end up. Mm. And then I reverse engineer it from that point. So and, and it's a little weird. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, how long does it roughly take you to put a book together? Uh, the fastest I've ever done one is three months. Okay. Um, but for me, they tend to take about a year. Um, right. I'm working on speeding it up, but I find that a year is enough time to like put it aside and then go back in and make changes and then put it aside. It always feels much more thin if I don't mm. give it breathing space in between drafts. And do you, um, you know, like, do you do that kind of classic Stephen King thing where you have a house somewhere in some like remote like County and, and you type on an old typewriter, or is it, or, or is it a lot more kind of standard than that? Mine, mine's weird in the other direction. I work <laughs> in fifteen to twenty minute increments. Oh, that's very spaced out between everything else that is going on in my life. So, like your professional life, family, all that stuff. Exactly. So, if there's a hole, I put some writing into it. Um, mm. Sometimes it's on my iPhone. Sometimes oh, wow. I have one of these remarkable tablets. Sometimes it's on a tablet. Sometimes it's on paper. So the first draft is always just like, it's a hot mess across many different axes. Interesting. <laughs> and then it, uh, and then I, I, so I take that draft and then I do a sort of a cleaned up version when I put it into the computer as a coherent whole. And then that's sort of my first two drafts right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah. And, and like apologies that so many of our questions or my questions are about like the process because that's really what my channel's about. It's like, you know, I'm trying to inspire people to create stuff. You know, sure. like I, I love creating stuff. And sometimes people are afraid to to make that leap, right? Because they have mm -hmm. this fear of failure, which is failure is a guarantee. Like you're gonna oh, yeah. fail. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's a guarantee. So it's like you're actually doing it for that small chance that you'll succeed, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh 
And uh, yeah, no, that that's a lot of fun. And just one more question on the on your process: Is it do you use like Google Docs to sort of consolidate all of the different uh, mediums into one sort of database or ledger of words, or do you use different programs? So I started out using Word. Word and mm -hmm. I get along very well. Mm -hmm. um, I eventually moved over to a program called Scrivener, mm. which does all the organization in sort of a very writing friendly fashion. And I can interesting. I've never outline. heard of that one. It's it, you know it's been popular in the writing community for I think probably the past five or six years. Interesting, and it also has a like a like a web based sort of cloud based uh, version, so that you can write from anywhere type of thing. It, it does not. Oh, um, interesting. Which is, but it's the one I collate everything into. Mm -hmm. Like all of my snippets go into uh, in, go into a Dropbox account that I have, and then from there I can bring them all into Scrivener and organize everything and figure out where the holes are and figure out the outline and the narrative flow and all of those pieces. Gotcha. Google Docs chokes at around three hundred pages. Oh, around, I see. I didn't even know that. Pages. Yeah. So I've tried. But mm. consolidating everything into the final work in Google Docs just isn't. You know, what, one program that I use with, with my collaborators that I've actually have nothing but great things to say, but I don't know if you can do a whole manuscript on it, is called Writer's Duet. And uh -huh. it's for, it, it's kind of like Google Docs, but it's very specific for like screenwriting and playwriting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they might have a my, manuscript type version, but it's really intended more for collaborating. Mm -hmm. So then multiple people can be on the same file and it has a very easy to use kind of editing his history and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, first of all, that's fascinating. And congratulations on, on your book. Do, do you, um, with your first book, do you ever go back and kind of revisit it and reread it? Or is it pretty much like something that you have in your mind or do you ever actually go back to it? I, you know, I usually, there's almost, I'd say, a year between the point in time when I give it to my editors and they say, okay, we're going to we're gonna start the publication process mm -hmm. and when it actually comes out. So when it is hot off the presses, I'll do a last read of it just to like sure. remember everything. And by that point, I've forgotten everything, right? Or everything is <laughs> right. now, is now uh, sort of quieted down up here enough where it feels like I'm reading a new book. And that's sort of my final final read through. And then, you know, for you, uh, for a variety of reasons, sometimes I have to go back and refer to it. Like if I'm going to, if I'm doing an outline for a new book based on the old book, gotcha. I have a copy that's like all marked up so I can remember where everything is. It, uh, so. And do you have, do you have that kind of Walt Whitman esque need like to keep rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it or, or are you pretty good about writing it and not really touching it too much more? I would like to rewrite it and rewrite it, but I've recognized that when I do that, I don't go anywhere. Right. So I now actively limit myself and I rely on, on, you know, my the other authors that I may have read the work or my, my agent or my editor to tell me when things need an extra pass. Um, mm. Not because I don't want to, it's actually sort of a, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a process piece where, I get it far enough along and I'm like, all right, it needs other eyeballs because otherwise I'll never, I'll never keep going. Right. I, you can edit one chapter for 10 years and, <laughs> and never have it perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, for, for folks that don't know, there's a very, you know, one of the most famous American authors of, of our, you know, of all time, Walt Whitman wrote a short story called the leaves of grass, or I'm sorry, a poem, an epic poem called the leaves of grass. And that was the only thing he ever worked on. He just kept re-releasing -re the leaves of grass and it kept growing and growing and growing like a tree. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just his, his way of doing things. Um, so, so how did you get into the whole writing thing? Did you also write for video games? Do, do we have that? Like, like your, because your career, um, really started in video games very early on. Right. Mm -hmm. it, so, it so, so, yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, about that. So, so I was originally an English major mm. and, um, you know, when I got into, when I got out of that and went and I was a stockbroker for a few years and I said, oh, wow, I'm going to bring a, my work home, <laughs> that, it's got to be quite something a jump. That's quite everyone's going to love. Exactly. So I went yeah. back and I went to art school and I got my art degree and that's where I got into, 
uh, 3D modeling, 3D animation. Oh, um, interesting, I like was, a fine art degree. Exactly. I was a oh. I was a uh, illustration major, and I dragged that over into uh, 3D modeling and rendering, which were brand new. I was a beta tester on Maya 1.0. Oh, wow. That's so cool. So it's, um, but I came out of that and I was a texture painter for a few years. And then I went over and went full time into video games from there because it was, you know, there was all. As an artist, as a video game artist. Exactly. Exactly. As an artist. Um, And because I had the English major and because I write, I would, you know, I would get picked up because I worked for indie studios. And when you're in an indie studio, oh, if somebody course. finds Everybody out you can everything. do something, yeah, you yeah. do that thing, <laughs> right? 1,000%. Exactly. 1,000%. So that, so th- I've done a lot of game writing, but it's always like, it's pickup pieces. It's been, you know, we have to, we have to come up with something to pitch. So here's, you know, we need five pages of a story here mm. or our artist went to Burning Man and isn't returning phone calls. Can you please finish the <laughs> script here? So most of my game writing until I um, started my own studio was like random pickup pieces, jumping in and out of other people's styles, mm. which was a lot of fun, but none of it was really mine. It, and what studio was this, if you don't mind me asking, uh, this early studio that, that, that you worked at? So, uh, geez, I worked at, uh, I started with Blue Planet. Um, I don't know if you, you can... know, remember Blue Planet, working for Hank Rogers. They owned uh, Tetris. Oh, and wow. So we did okay. the OEM release of Tetris Worlds for the Xbox and the PlayStation 2. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so I worked on some of the backstory for the for the Minos and sort of for, for the backstory that goes behind the world of Tetris Worlds. Mm, I helped interesting. Uh, you know, work to craft that. Then I came out of there and I went to go work for, I, I went into mobile after that point. Working mm-hmm. for guys like Lava Mind, working for Jamdat, mm. um, and then I started getting pickup work for Activision as a texture painter, and then oh, I. Oh wow, that's so fascinating! This kind of jumping from these disciplines—it's like true video game renaissance a person. <laughs> that, that that that's that's fascinating. That's fascinating. It is. I mean, the the fun thing about working with the indies and the startups is that you can try everything. Sure. Right. Which which gives you a very broad base. But the the you know, the the eventually, in part because I started life as a stockbroker. Right, I which I'm still not computing. Studio. I'm still not fully computing how that works into the thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was early days. That was like right out of college. I started as an uh, uh, an assistant, then I got my seven, then I got my sixty-three, you know, right. then I started working in the industry for for uh, first for Payne Weber, then for Dean Witter and Morgan Stanley, and then I said, you know what? I've, if I'm if this is going to come into my house, I need it to be something that my whole family is going to going to be able to participate in. So I went back and got the art degree and went for video games. That's awesome. That's awesome. And do do you still? Um, because look, obviously, my current sort of obsession and passion, and I come from the video game space. Mm-hmm. Then I started two big media companies. Um, and then after I kind of, because media is actually a lot easier than video games in terms of like, number one, I can create a studio where I can pump out, you know, 20 videos a week, you know? So my iteration on what's working and not working is much quicker. I have an audience. I can see what's, what's working, what's not working Mm -hmm. where video games is a very isolated thing you know like and it also takes a very very long time you know to make games like still to this day like it took us years you know to make you know gta back in the day like i remember i mean you know max Payne when when i was working with 3d realms on that like it was always like hey guys when are we going to get that new build and the answer is always when it's ready you know Uh, and like you just kind of had to deal with that you know Mm -hmm. um but the the now going back in into gaming, my my primary obsession for years now has been VR, mm-hmm. um, and it's something that I know that you're also very obviously very keen on. Could you tell me a little bit about your current kind of gig over at Meta, working in the VR? What 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 that's like? Sure. I mean, right now I'm more on the biz dev side, so okay. I work for uh, Reality Labs, which is owned by Meta, mm-hmm. and I am a uh, content strategy lead. So part of my job is figuring out what's not yet in VR and now MR 
and what you know well, what it, what is what it takes to get those and mr you're saying it's kind of like a mix of like uh of like ar and vr you guys call it mr so yeah it's a it's a spectrum right so vr is your world is completely replaced mm -hmm. ar is you're just painting on top of the real world right so it the glasses format that everybody thinks of. MR is uh, sort of in between. So you've still got the screens like you do for VR, but if you're using things like pass-through cameras, so you're seeing the real world, but you're weaponizing those screens in order to give a better, uh, sort of a better AR experience. No, no, 1000%. And, um, you know, we've, we've tried, my, my dev team has tried to do all kinds of experiments, um, trying to, you know, I'm not even sure I should say this, but semi hacking the 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 API to actually dig into the pass through camera and create mm -hmm. functionality with the pass through camera. And, and I, you know, hopefully Meta will start opening that up a little bit more so developers can play with it more. Like I've already seen some examples of that, but like the possibilities for combining, um, you know, uh, you know, VR and AR into this MR type situation is just fascinating. Like, you know, this is a, you know, don't, don't judge me for the idea because I actually think it's a, it's a really interesting idea, but we had this demo that we were trying to put together called, you know, it was just a working title. It was called home invasion mm -hmm. where you would literally scan your house um, mm -hmm. and then try to simulate, you know, what would happen if somebody actually tried to break in, you know, right. And like actually being in your three dimensional space created like the output that actually happened was it, it just creates an incredibly tense, horrific, you know, experience. It's like the way that VR can scare you is like nothing else I've ever experienced. Do, yep. do you have any kind of intellectual like, um, you know, uh, sort of idea about why VR is so scary? I, you know, the, the research that's out there suggests that a VR experience touches your memory the same way that a real life physical experience does. Sure. Um, as opposed to something that's on like a flat screen, right, which apparently right. writes it writes into your brain into a completely different area than actual which is memory. Amazing. Right, so I think right. it has to do with the way your brain sort of parses that experience mm. and it just presumes that it's more real. Uh, because yeah. it's all around you. Yeah, like there's this game out there. I'm sh I'm sure you've probably heard of it. It's called Phasmophobia. Uh, or yes. Are you familiar with it? Yes. Uh -huh. I, and this game is like literally the simplest game that you can ever imagine. It's one environment, four players. You don't really do much. You know, there's a timer that goes off and then like a, a, a ghost starts appearing after like 10, 15 minutes of being in the environment of literally doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's like one of the scariest, most tense experiences that you can ever have, right? Like mm -hmm. the simplicity. So, it, so it's like all the virtue of how cool this application is, is almost ex completely on the weight of how cool VR is as a sort of like immersion technology. You know, it's, right. it, it's, it's very fascinating to me. Do, do you play Phasmophobia at all or have you... I have not for a long time. Right, right. Um, I play a lot of VR, um, just in terms really? of, of looking for looking for new content and sure, looking sure. for new stuff that's out there all the time. So, uh, have you have you ever? Um, what what do you play? Um, is there anything that has impressed you recently, like amongst that 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 you've noticed? Because like for me currently. Um, and like, I have a full VR studio. I'm a certified uh, meta Oculus publisher. Mm -hmm. I've released uh, games on the quest. Um, I currently have one game that it's on app lab and I've never gotten it pushed through to the main store, which I'm not sure exactly why, to be honest with you, but mm -hmm. it's, it's the only room scale, um, multiplayer basketball game on the platform. Uh -huh. and, and, and like, it's funny because it actually got released by accident. One of my developers pressed the wrong button when we were doing like the testing or whatever, and it got uploaded huh. and we've never taken it down because we have like five, 6,000 people play that thing every month, you know? And sure. it's like, and it's, you know, a lot of fun. Um, but that experience, that kind of multiplayer basketball experience where you're sweating and it's like, you're literally playing basketball with your buddies. I mean, like that's the power of, you know, of VR. And, 
Um, now I'm doing another one that's like a big kind of metaverse um, type game, mm -hmm. you know, where, where, where it's really like, you know, inspired to my original point, to my favorite, I think the, the most impressive VR game I've ever seen is a game called Rec Room, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Yes. Um, um, and, you know, Rec Room was one of the first games I ever played uh, back when I got my, you know, original, I think I first played on the HTC Vive mm -hmm. back in like 2016. Um, and it's just like the way that that game has grown mm -hmm. and the way that that game has fostered a community of creators to generate content for that game is to me, it, it's absolutely mind blowing, you know, and, and look, and it shows the company just recently got valued at $4 billion. So, you know, this is obviously like a very serious piece of software, oh, yeah. um, but is there anything like on that level that has touched you like in the VR space? The, you know, I find the, the UGC uh, in the VR space always, I always find it a little bit wobbly because I mm. predominantly use the Quest. Mm -hmm. So I don't tend to use the tethered experiences quite sure, so me much. Either. Right. And I think that, you know, as a longtime uh, games artist, optimization is king. Mm -hmm. And I find that that the UGC aspect, I adore it. And I think that it is absolutely 100% the way to go. But I think that there's got to be some some way to to train up the people creating the spaces oh, God, and creating you're... UGC. So like if you go into something like VR chat, mm -hmm. you know, you suddenly are you suddenly are going at a slower frame rate um, right. than you right. might have been elsewhere. Just and it changes from boy. room to room as well, right? Like, like there is no standard. Yeah, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, f f you know, first of all, um, that's music to my ears, what you're saying, because that is my number one challenge, right? Like, mm -hmm. when I think of a metaverse experience, right, personally, and this is, only, this is only my personal philosophy, I think it needs to have a few key elements. Mm -hmm. One element I think it needs to have is ownership. Um, and I'd love to get your uh, you know thoughts on that, but we can get into that like in a second. Okay. Um, the second thing I think it needs to have is um, a sort of user generated uh, you know tool set so that users can create their own content, um, yeah. and and that the game incentivizes them in some mm -hmm. way to create that content. Right. Like I think the greatest metaverse experience on the planet currently is something called YouTube. Right. Like it's a very simple platform that incentivizes users to create content to upload it on the platform and it's made the platform into the most powerful media platform on the planet right mm -hmm. and i think that that's possible for games but to your point um and the other thing i think it does need is interoperability but that's also an extremely difficult thing to get and i'm sure you've heard that word a thousand times and and sure and you and, and i'm sure you realize how difficult that actually is right yes um and um you know, for us, the way that we're trying to tackle it, because you're absolutely right, like Rec Room has an incredible UGC creator, but it's this weird dark art version, kind of Minecrafty, but even more complicated. And the barrier to enter is so high um, mm -hmm. to be able to do anything interesting with it um, that 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 even though, to be honest with you, I have no idea how much how there's so many good things on it because it's such a difficult platform to use mm -hmm. that these little kids are figuring out how to make like, you know, this one kid made uh, like the first three levels of half-life Alex mm -hmm. inside rec room. And it's almost the same thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're like, how are you doing this? Um, you know, for us, we're thinking, is there a way to create an SDK where you do it offline with unreal to try and like, you know, standardize these things and like well, look we have different examples of it but you're absolutely right like what what's the magic of creating a a system of you know UGC that's accessible to a lot of people because the barrier to enter to making games is so high yeah you know is this something that you guys are thinking about or trying to brainstorm and and have different kind of like trains of thought about how to maybe do it there's, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of work streams trying to figure some of this out. I think it's, I mean, it's out of my particular department that mm -hmm. really falls under engineering. So I can't say, 
Sure. But if you look at, you know, if you look at things like Roblox, if you look at uh, Creativeverse, if you look at, you know, all of these different UGC driven platforms, mm -hmm. you know, part of their, part of their tool set, um, you know, the, the better the tool set gets, the better the stuff created for the platform gets, right? Sure. And some of them will gate, right? So you can create whatever you want, but if it, you know, runs at a certain frames per second in the test environment, if it's got too many polys, okay, you, it'll only pop up in the store on PCs. Right, right. right? Or it, it, if it's, you know, and if it's really small and lightweight, okay, then it'll show up on the mobile stores, right? Sure. So the, I think the groundwork is getting established even, even outside of VR. I mean, if you look at the comparison to these kinds of experiences on mobile versus, mm. uh, you know, what you're going to see on PC, I think it's, you know, I think the tool set is important. I think the, um, the on, sort of the onboarding experience, what I think of the onboarding experience is how easy is it for people to start building out spaces? Mm -hmm. And then you get into things like, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have an in-game economy? People who build things, can they sell them to other people? Are you sure. going to use cash? Are you going to use, you know, in-world dollars? You know, is it tr trade in kind? I'll build you stuff if you build the level design, right? Mm. So all of these things are are optional, but... It and, and to the last point that you made, because it's such a, you know, it speaks to my concept of incentive, right? Like you need incentive as a critical piece of the equation. Um, are you guys kind of, you know, putting the old cross against, uh, you know, blockchain and, and, and cryptocurrencies and stuff like that? Or, or is that something that, you know, you guys are open to exploring? Or is that something like, you know, Steam, Minecraft? There's been several major companies that have made a stance against it. Um, mm -hmm. Are you guys open to it and still kind of wait and see, or is it kind of like, no, nah, no thanks? Well, I mean, given that Facebook is is exploring NFTs over on Instagram, sure. and you know the and, and we've had our own you know run at at doing sort of a yeah, there's an entire department inside Facebook that explores that stuff. Yeah, I think it's I think it really is about figuring out the best shape of it. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's, I think it's much more of a, a, uh, you know, let's figure out the best way to do this than a straight up. No, sure. I know sure. for, for VR, you know, if I am, if I'm taking pitches for a game, we will do a much deeper technical dive. Uh, if there's, you know, a blockchain element or, or, you know, a, a crypto element or a monetization mm -hmm. element, just because we need to understand what's coming onto the platform, right? We we don't want right, to be right because you don't want exploitation. You know, you don't want like piracy, like hacking, like you know, it, it, like something like uh, Axie Infinity that was like the biggest you know NFT game on the planet. You know, got hacked for six hundred million dollars, right? So like you want to, you know, yep. You know, and like we've seen that in crypto too, right? Sure. I mean, there's been a number of crypto markets that have just gone. They've been hacked in Celsius just recently, you know, uh, Terra, like Terra Luna or whatnot, like mm -hmm. 1000 percent. Right. And, yeah. and like if you because, you know, one thing, if you give gamers a game, they're going to try to hack it. You know, like like yep. like it's just, you know, you can expect it. Sure. I mean, we even see this in stuff like Eve Online. Right. Where sure. where, you know, that's the 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 mindset of, of, you know, people whose, whose entertainment is solving puzzles, right? If you're solving right. puzzles as part of your enjoyment, whether it's who do I have to shoot in which order or whether or not it's a literal <laughs> puzzle, like how do I assemble these cubes into a staircase? Sure. You know, that, that, that absolutely follows along, I think. Look, and, and even something like, I'm, I'm sure a book that has inspired us both, um, Snow Crash, right? Like the entire thought behind Snow Crash is that there is a hacker hacking the game and you know trying to destroy it from the inside, right? By yep. infecting people with the snow crash, you know, virus. Um, so you know, look, uh, life imitates art, and you know, there's no doubt that for us, that's also a huge concern. That's why on my platform currently, we don't allow any blockchain transaction inside the game. Mm -hmm. It all happens on a secured network outside the game. It, it, and the game only reads your MetaMask uh, data, right? So right. your MetaMask is completely independent from the game. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and your game reads that data and uses that data. But even though we can technically send, and I've already done tests on it, send mm -hmm. blockchain transactions from inside the game, mm -hmm. um, and it absolutely works even on the Quest, it's not something that I'm comfortable with because I have no idea how easy it would be to hack. Yeah. You know, and, and like that's a that's a scary, it's a scary thought. It's a scary yeah. thought. No, it absolutely um, is. What do you what do you think about like the more kind of extreme simulations? Like, do you ever mess around with those like stuff like DCS World? Are you familiar with that one? Uh I'm not familiar with DCS, but there are a couple of the sort of the world and and galactic simulators out there sure, that I do sure. that I do like to play with. I haven't run into one that's super deep that can run on something like the Quest. Right. A right. lot of them tend to be tend to be PC, you know, PC builds, right? Just because they're Almost particles all for of days. <laughs> right, right, right. But look, one of the beautiful things about the quest, and I, I highly recommend the quest, it's the best headset you can buy right now. Um, mm -hmm. is um, you know, through the air link, um, mm -hmm. there's nothing you can't play, right? Like if you have sure. a, a you know, a Wi-Fi 6.0 and, and and you know, good Ethernet, you can play anything on the quest, yep. which is beautiful. Um have you gotten uh, like a little sneak peek at the new quest, the Cambria or whatever it's called? I, I actually have no idea what it's called, but there's like a new quest, right? That like some some folks have gotten a chance to try out. Mm -hmm. So I out? know I haven't yet. Mark announced it, I think, at last year's Connect. Uh, mm -hmm. He announced that Cambria was coming down the line, but I haven't had a chance uh, to test it out. It is a it is a pro device as opposed mm. to a gaming device. So if I were to if I were to have early access to anything it would be toward the the more gaming focused. Is it know, tethered product. or untethered? It's still untethered, right? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because like one of the things that I get concerned with is that like I I spend so much manpower developing mm -hmm. for the chip inside the Quest as my minimum. And I'm trying to do multiplayer, dedicated servers, tons of people on the thing, tons of different gameplay mechanics. And it's a lot to balance on this like little chipset when you yep. know the PC is just, it's right there waiting for you saying like, why, like you can do <laughs> all of this stuff without even worrying about it. Like, you know, and like, I get worried that by the time I'm actually ready to start letting players in, you guys mm -hmm. announce a new, you know, headset with a much bigger chip and I'm like, oh, crap, you know, <laughs> there's so much time. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, our policy, you know, and, and and as a developer, you're probably already aware of this, but, you know, our policy is that the the current generation of headset serves as the dev, dev kit for the next. Mm. Oh, so that's an interesting philosophy. I like and, that. And everything's got to be backward. You know, it's, it's got to be compatible, mm. you know, just like we did with the Quest 1 and the Quest 2. I don't know if sure. you remember, but we required Quest 1 support for, I think it was almost a full year. Oh, I remember uh, my, my basketball game was for the Quest 1. There you go. Yeah, and yeah. I, I anticipate that's going to continue into the future. I don't have a signal on it yet, mm -hmm. but we've laid the groundwork very firmly that look, if you've got the if you've got the latest gear now, when the new gear shows up, you, as a developer, you've already got your dev kit in your hands, mm. right? And and you're just going to be laddering forward from there. Yeah, no, that's that that's fascinating. Um, you know, um, God, there's so many. You know, people are probably like listening, like, like, what the hell? Like, this guy's talking about such specific things. But, you know, um, you know, VR, um, it's like, you know, one thing that I always get as a pushback, you know, when when we do, you know, we have a couple of brands that are working with us and that are interested in our thing. And, you know, we've got some deals that are unannounced. And like their their big thing that they always tell me is, is there going to be a flat screen, you know, version of it? Sure. You know, and, and it's like. When I hear that, I always cringe because it's like my commitment to the paradigm of of interacting with a game experience with, you know, locomotion, whether it's teleport or full with your hands, with not having to have character animations per se, because you are the, the character animating in real time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the multiplayer elements, these are all things that are extremely sort of endemic to the VR environment. Mm -hmm. um, but yet people always want to talk about, hey, make sure that you have the, the flat screen port. Um, do you see good uptick with the 
adoption of VR? Does it feel like it's plateauing to you? How do you see the marketplace as a whole? I mean, given the, you know, I mean, given the, the rate at which we've gone from zero to a hundred, mm -hmm. right? I think Mark announced at last connect that we'd crossed a billion dollars in revenue. Sure. And that was and it's like 20 million headsets, right? Or something like that. I don't, I don't know if they've announced an actual sure, figure sure. for the headset. Right. But you know, I mean, the rate at, since the launch of the Quest, the rate at which the, the ecosystem has expanded, the number of developers building for, for VR and the number of publishers that are now, you know, more and more often announcing, hey, okay, we're going to do a VR port, we're going to do a VR SKU for this title. You know, I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. I Right. It's my opinion that we do not have enough VR developers in the world for what's coming down between us, between oh. uh, you know PlayStation, between what Apple and Google are doing. I mean, the it, I agree. It, I'm having a tough time um, hiring. So if anybody listening to this want, knows how to use the <laughs> Unreal Engine and wants to work on a VR game, hit me up. Um, and if you know anybody that 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 you want to give a job to, I'm 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 very open to that because you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to like find somebody. Um, and like I chose Unreal, mm -hmm. um, which is maybe like a mistake. Um, but you know, there's such convergence happening between Hollywood um, and video games in terms of assets of like I'm talking oh, low yeah. level, low level conversion, mm -hmm. like. I work with brands and they're able to literally give me their files from their scenes yep. already lit and rendered inside Unreal. Um, so I can literally just use their actual files, you know? It's and, fantastic, and that's, isn't it? Oh, it, it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And yes, it's more difficult to work in Unreal. Um, C++ is more difficult than C Sharp. There, there's sure. more people understand C++, uh, I'm sorry, C Sharp. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a challenge, but like, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like when it comes to the old supply and demand, like the demand for developers far exceeds the supply. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, Unreal is, I started, you know, I, I got my break in gaming by being a uh, an Unreal Tournament modder, right? Doing oh, texture packs so cool. for Unreal Tournament. That's so, so cool. So I love, I love Unreal. I've used Unreal many, many times over the years. So and it's just it has evolved into a into a cinematic level piece, right? Yeah. But most of the VR developers are using Unity, and so mm -hmm. we have that Venn diagram of what do you have more of? Do you have more money, or do you have more time? If you have more time, right. then Unity can be like tweaked and adjusted and fiddled with until you get something that's almost cinematic quality. If you have money. You can hire people at the, you know, the appropriate salary level to just do the unreal stuff. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So those are the the way I always think about the two primary engines yeah, is, you know, where does your, as your company, where do you, where's your, uh, you know, where's your biggest resource going to be? Yeah. Like, I feel like I've just met my more successful twin sister. This is uh this is very, <laughs> this is very cool. Uh, here me ask you like a very specific question about the modding. Um, because actually my philosophy of UGC is really built out of that kind of modding community mm -hmm. and how they were able to sort of do straight imports of maps, straight imports of objects, mm -hmm. and then just kind of drop the code bits on top of it, you know, right. and like not, not have to do too much and get really high levels of quality. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think it's, it's necessary in this kind of metaverse VR type of experience for the UGC to be created in, in you know what, let me ask this, let me ask this another way. As okay. a business development person, right. would you, um, would you uh, a kind of fault a application that you look at mm -hmm. that has the modding outside the game versus inside the game? Like, like the UGC creation tools. I would not fault it. Um, we have a number of creative tools on platform that are, are, you know, designed for building environments and, and building objects and that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you were to, to design a game and then have the mod tools on, you know, as flat screen, I don't think that's necessarily a detriment. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, 
you know, I think it's a bit cooler if you can do some of the modding in headset, obviously. Obviously, but obviously. It, um, you, you would get a much larger pool of modders involved if it's on flat screen, right? Because there's a, a large group of people out there who, who do these mods, especially if incentivized, mm -hmm. almost like a day job. Right. right, and, right. And they're they're creating assets and they create them and then they bring them into Roblox and they bring them into, you know, into VR chat and they bring them into alt space and like everywhere they can deliver an asset, they deliver the assets. Yeah. yeah. So and the and the problem with UGC is volume. Right. Right. Volume of quality assets until you have enough stuff. You know, you you're you're just sort of run, you know, you're you're always kind of hamstrung by what what people can create. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good point. It, it, um, yeah, because it's fascinating if you look up like alt space, like like uh, you know, VR chat avatars. Mm -hmm. There's like entire companies out there that are you know their entire business model is just to create avatars for people that want to do VR chat, and they're mm -hmm. selling them for six hundred bucks, seven hundred bucks, depending. You yeah. can customize it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how, how do you see the copyright issues with some of that stuff, right? Like there's a there's another one that's come up. I'm, sh I'm not sure if you've checked it out yet. It's actually very interesting because they allow you to import OBJ files and FTL files and all kinds okay. of files. It's called Neos VR. Have you heard of this one? Neos? I've heard of it. Yeah. I haven't looked into it super deeply yet, but it's on my uh, radar. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a very interesting one in terms of the the end experience is not nearly as sharp as uh, something like Rec Room, mm -hmm. but the promise of, of being able to create UGC um, using existing assets from outside mm -hmm. the game is actually very smart. You can add like, you know, logic and behavior. So, sorry, I live in Miami now. Like I moved from LA to Miami and like this is Miami. Like I literally like look at this light. Like <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> I can do. Yeah. So so I apologize for that. But um, yeah, it, it's actually quite fascinating because they're they're kind of doing what I want you to be able to do that I think is very easy to do in flat screen, mm -hmm. and they're trying to do that inside of the game um, by letting you import. You know, like and you know, like me and my team went in there. And we started importing files from my game mm -hmm. and we didn't figure out how to add the textures to it, but you know, the entire model was coming in, you know, and somehow getting auto optimized. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's on PC. So, so it's, so it, it's, it's PC only. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's got that advantage to it, but um, yeah, it's very interesting the way that they're kind of messing with it. Yeah, no, it's, you know, particularly for social titles, which is where I, uh, whenever you say UGC, my, my brain always goes to the big social platforms first. Right? Sure, sure, sure. You know, it, those do as well as they do because they're on every platform, mm -hmm. right? They're on PC, they're on mobile, they're, you know, if they can, they get on PlayStation, they get on Xbox, they get on you know, the, the Kindle fire, they're on, you know, they're on Mac, they're on VR, they're like, they're everywhere, mm -hmm. which I think for social is, is one of the key things. And when you're looking at it from a platform ubiquity perspective, mm -hmm. then, you know, having the, having the UGC creation aspect be on flat screen and being able to put the power of your PC into things like auto optimization, uh, you know, that, you know, that, that sort of makes it easier for that content to show up yeah. everywhere. Right. Yeah. Like, I think that my ambition, and that's why I like, I ultimately think rec room is the best one because mm -hmm. rec room is the best one at giving you gameplay mechanics that you integrate seamlessly into the social experience, you right. know, and, and they're so good at it. Um, they're shooting mechanic they're you know, their car driving mechanic, uh, their whatever, their, you know, their sword fighting mechanic. Mm -hmm. they, they're very good at, like, letting you use actual gameplay mechanics to create content. So it feels, to your point, a little less like a social experience, which, you know, VR chat and Neos definitely feels more like a social experience. Mm -hmm. um, it, it feels like an, like an expanding game experience. Um, you know, like, like the, it's a great title, like, like an expanding rec room, you know, mm -hmm. and, 
And for us, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build game mechanics that we can bundle up and give to the users so that they can integrate them into their own map. So a lot more like modding mm -hmm. um, than, than like, um, you know, building, you know, it's just because I guess modding implies that you're just modding their existing game, right? With right. New, with new maps, mm -hmm. um, which I guess is, is what we're trying to do, you know, um, did, do you, have you ever heard of a platform called mod.io? I the name is familiar, but I don't I don't have anything in my I don't yeah. have a file in my head for it. <laughs> there's there's one game um, that's on Quest. It's an incredibly impressive game, um, very very impressive game called Contractors, and it's just a straight yeah. up shooter. It's just a shooter <laughs> game, but the way that Contractors has integrated mod.io and sort of off screen modding for mm -hmm. their game has generated some incredible, incredible um, content. You know, like basically these kids have essentially recreated Call of Duty inside of, of contractors, right? So it's like all these maps that are, you know, so beloved for so long inside Call of Duty, you can now live inside of and play with this incredible game inside the quest, uh, which leads me to my question, which I think I asked, but just to go back to it, like... Mm -hmm how do you see the sort of copyright and mod thing or UGC thing working? Cause even in rec room, a kid's game, you can go in there, search for star Wars and there's 3000 star Wars experiences. And I guarantee you not one of them is licensed. Right. So, sure. so, so how do you see the whole copyright with UGC uh, dance working? So, I mean, at the moment, a lot of the times the platform is responsible, right. For, for, swinging the bat at stuff that goes over the line. Mm. A lot of studios these days, and I'm, I'm looking at the not recent, but maybe 10 years ago kerfluffle that uh, CBS had with some of their fan-made Star Trek movies that were yes. popping up out there. Um, sort of on the heels of that, it, it seems like studios and IP holders have started to formalize the idea that if you're not making money off of it and you're not hurting the brand, you know, there's a, there's a world where we can coexist. Mm -hmm. Right. And you've got, you know, like if you go to Amazon, there are authors who have opened up their IPs and said, look, if you want to write in my world, fine, you have my permission, you can publish it on Amazon. You just can't make any money off of it because then you're taking money away from me. Sure. Right. So I think that there's a, there's a, a difference between a, a 10 year old trying to recreate lightsaber battles in <laughs> Minecraft right. and a professional studio that is trying to uh, build a Star Wars game without consulting, you know, uh, Lucasfilm and Disney. Yeah. And I think that yeah. that where you fall on the spectrum determines the size of the hammer that the IP owner will swing. <laughs> First of all, that's very, very well said. And now I'm a little bit scared because I don't know like <laughs> how much of, you know, because like, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's very well said. Um, uh, because yeah, something like, like, um, like contractors, for example, not, you know, not to draw any negative light because it's a beautiful game. It really is a sure. the best shooter. It's the best shooter on the quest, right? Like mm -hmm. without a doubt, it's better than onward. It's, it's really a great, great game. Um, so much of the UGC is tied into two very specific properties, Call of Duty and Halo, right? Those are the two very popular things that people mod around. Right. And it's free. You, you, mm -hmm. you, you don't pay for any of these maps, but, you know, it, it, it's the, the game itself is benefiting from it, mm -hmm. right? The game does cost money. It's not a free game, right? It costs 24 sure. bucks or whatever it is. Um, so isn't there an argument that the game is taking money away from the brand holders? You know what? A, a, a lawyer would know. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I am not, Fair I am enough. definitely not a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 if the game is being treated as a platform, then if, you know, in Halo or, or the Halo rights holders or the Call of Duty holders, you know, come the same way that, you know, if you go to YouTube and you say, hey, these right, guys right, stole my right. music. They take it down and then figure it out afterwards. Or demonetize right? it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Whatever thing they can do to you. Exactly. And I think I, I think it, what it really boils down to is money. 
right? right? If the if the people creating this content are charging for it, then that's that's an immediate takedown, right? I think the the but I think it's the these days it seems to be the platform owners onus to take stuff down when requested. And it's the IP owner's onus to go find it. Um, right, right. And that may change, right? Especially as all of this UGC continues to grow and grow and grow. But I mean, you'd have, they'd have to go after, you know, archive, archive of our own. They'd have mm. to go after all of these different places where, you know, fan fiction gets published, right? And, right. and mods get published and, uh, you know, riffs on songs get published and it's becoming, you know, I, what it really comes down to, I think, is like the professional drive on it. Right, right. Right. Is it being treated as a professional moneymaker as opposed to I love these two characters. I'm going to ship them and put it up on on the Internet. <laughs> right. And for something like Horizon Worlds and I have been on Horizon Worlds um, I think with with so many other kind of experiences like that out there that are so much further ahead, it feels a little bit like it needs some catching up, you know, to do. Mm -hmm. um, but but I can see they're trying and there's some cool stuff going on in there. Um, does Horizon Worlds, first of all, Horizon Worlds does have some kind of UGC strategy, obviously, right? Like um, there, there's some creator system inside of it. I, so Horizon Worlds, because I'm on the sourcing side and I'm mm -hmm. I'm dealing with third party studios, I don't get to touch anything Horizon related. We are fair enough, fair there's enough. a hard wall between the people who interact with developers and anything going on internally because we don't want cross pollination. So right. we that's a bright line that we try really hard to maintain. Okay, so yeah, they don't yeah, let yeah. me have any of that. They don't let me have any of the internal toys. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, because like you can see that there could be some you know contamination of ideas, and then this one person can say, "Well, I met with her and I signed the NDA, and now that's there." So I actually totally, totally get that. Um, no, first of all, that you know that's that's um, that's really interesting. I could probably talk to you about VR all day. I know we're we're getting close to um, to our to our time here, mm -hmm. um, but where do you where do you see? the VR industry, like in the next, I don't know, five years? You know, it, so this is me putting on my futurist hat, really. Yeah. Um, yes. And which is half the fun, right? Uh, 1000%. You know, I mean, I can see all the Star Trek behind you. And I'm sure that <laughs> I can take us down a holodeck rabbit hole for like the next 45 minutes too. But um, totally. No, yeah. totally. And I think, you know, I think in the next five years, we're going to see we're going to see more competition, right? Mm, I, you know, uh, PlayStation's got their devices coming. Apple's rumored to have a device coming. Google is rumored to have a device coming. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, there's, By, there's ByteDance, which is a massive company, has a device that they just yeah. recently acquired. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think now we're now VR is big enough where there's going to be a fight. Mm, and I, I think like you know previously it was very much like oh yes VR it's kind of cute and it's a bit of a toy and I'm going to get one and put it away in the closet and never touch it again. And you know this and I'll be honest this version of VR I mean I've been watching VR since you know the Game Boy right the right, you know, right 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 decades ago so for me this is like our fourth iteration on sure. VR and. Uh, but I think there's enough big dogs coming into the playground now where we're really going to see some movement mm. because they're, people are going to start trying to outdo each other the way they do on the consoles. We'll, right. we'll start seeing people try to do exclusives. Like, I mean, S Sony practically made an art form out of exclusives on, on PlayStation. Yeah, I yeah. cannot see a world where they don't try to put that strategy into play oh, look, for uh, VR uh, and, and, you know, what comes next. And they've already done it to you know to a degree. I think two very good VR titles um, that we just recently were able to get on Quest via Airlink. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Hitman VR, which mm -hmm. which has a lot of problems, but sure. if you've ever played it, it's a friggin' masterpiece of 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 like immersion and storytelling. Have you ever played Hitman in I VR? Have, yeah, yeah. It, it's you know it's very clunky because they didn't really port the actual game mechanics. Yeah. pretty much just driving the third person character without any sort of endemic VR, you know, you know, like yeah. motion control. Mm -hmm. But if you can get past that and kind of understand how it works, 
-hmm. It's absolutely incredible, like nothing I've ever seen. Um, and then there's, you know, Resident Evil 7 was also mm -hmm. exclusive to uh, Sony. So, yep. you know, the, you know, Sony Sony has that kind of power that they're trying to do that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and, you know, I was very glad when, Microsoft, when uh, Resident Evil 4 finally came out for mm -hmm. the Quest. And now, you know, I think Among Us is coming out. And I think even one of the Grand Theft Autos um, is coming out. Maybe not the one that I worked on, uh, but I think uh, San Andreas... Hmm. is coming out on uh, on quest which I'm, I'm very interested to see how they pull that one off um but yeah um but i guess for any of this stuff to make sense you you need to have massive adoption right because if you look at the video game marketplace i mean you're looking at you know probably you know over a hundred million installed uh you know xboxes probably over a hundred million installed ps you know fours slash fives it's like there's a huge market that's kind of verified, yeah. you know, that's blue check marked, you yep. know, with, 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 with VR, you're still talking in the millions, right? Like for a VR game to sell a, like back when I was working at Rockstar, like if you didn't sell a million units, you were kind of a failure, right? Like yeah. it was kind of like a bust, mm -hmm. you know, if you sell a million units in VR, you're Beat Saber, you know? Yeah. So, so, you know, you're like a proper unicorn. Yeah. Um, do you think that adoption is going to keep ramping up? Or do you think people like the form factor, like one of the best um, conferences I've ever been to was Facebook connect. And it was the one that happened right before the coronavirus hit. Um, and it was such a, it was an incredible experience. And that's something that Mark on his keynote said mm -hmm. that he understands that the form factor is a limiting factor for people adopting. Sure. Do you do you think that that's going to change to a degree where it will bring in a lot more people? I, look, all technology gets smaller, lighter, and faster. That's sure. that's literally literally what it does over time. Yeah. And you know, it, it. I think it's inevitable that all of the VR, all the VR headsets, PlayStation's, Pico. You know, I mean, it, it's all going to get smaller, lighter, and faster because that's the goal. Right? right. The goal is not to build a headset and then woohoo, it's this forever. Right. Where right. It's just, it, you know, there's constant iteration. And I think if you compare Sony's, you know, the the sort of the the way that we're looking at, uh, you know, Sony's next generation headset versus the, you know, the one that I have sitting on the wall over there, there's already differences there. You've got mm -hmm. differences between the Quest One and the Quest Two, which is a massive lighter unit. Massive differences, yeah, massive differences. So I think it's I think it's fair to predict that all the VR technology is going to get smaller and faster. And do you think that that's the primary limiting factor for bringing in new users, or do you think there's something else going on that's preventing people from jumping from flat screen? Because like, I have thoughts. <laughs> you have thoughts. The first thing when I put on a VR headset, the very first thing my sister did was jump into my face and put her hands up like right, right in my <laughs> face and go, can you see me? Right. And I was playing Beat Saber. So I punched her in the head because <laughs> right. I didn't see her. I didn't know she was there. So I think that, you know, I think that as people get accustomed to seeing VR, right. And recognizing that, oh, that's, they're doing something in there, right? As more people have that put it on moment, mm -hmm. I think that's already starting to turn, right? It to to VR being a more, uh, let's say, a casual consumer adoption, mm -hmm. right? More people are looking at it and going, "Okay, that's a that's an actual thing. That person's playing a game. There's something going on there," as opposed to sort of this, you know, this this social social harassment that you get from family members when you put the headset on. Right, right, um, right. This and the, vulnerability from being disconnected from the outside world. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, friends and fam family always take advantage of that vulnerability, right? Like if you, right, if you right. put a paper bag on your head when you're 12, your brother comes up and punches you in the stomach. This is just <laughs> sibling 101. Um, but, you know, as 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 more and more of them show up, we're starting to see them in the TV ads now. TV shows are having them on. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's a VR headset. That's fine. And it's not right. like, you know, ooh. Right, right. I think, we're, I think we're headed that way. And as long as we keep improving the form factor, you know, I think it's we've, – we've almost completely nailed the motion sickness factor, right? There's mm -hmm. some people who, who 
still have it. There's some people that will will never be able to solve it for, except maybe in short short form. Yeah. But and it know. does go away. It does go away with training. Yeah. Because I'm extremely susceptible to motion sickness, and um, you can train yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. I I think designers should always have a teleport feature. I think that's like mandatory. Yeah. Where a lot of games still don't have teleport, you know, mm -hmm. like for example, Hitman does not have teleport. Right. So you have to like, for you to experience that magical world that they created, you have to suffer through <laughs> a couple of vomiting sessions. You through know? smooth motion. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that that the the nausea thing goes away, mm -hmm. but you have to be so enthralled with that. To your point, that put it on moment that you want to kind of power through that, you know? Right. And, and look, it's not for everybody, but like, if, like, I think if, if the experiences um, become, you know, because if the experiences become so kind of ubiquitous where you get that FOMO, if like, if I'm not in there, I'm losing out on culture, mm -hmm. um, that, that then people I think will start getting more acclimated to it, you know, yeah. but you know, maybe look, maybe that's my one of my thoughts is that VR still needs that one application, that Fortnite, where it's like it's mandatory that you're not a cool kid at school if you're not playing that. And like as good as Rec Room is, it's not that, right? You know? Not yet. Not yet. Could be. Could right. Be. I mean, it's it's not at all unusual that a title like that emerges from an existing title, right? Rather sure. than being something something completely new out of the gate. So yeah, look, it's, one thousand percent. You know, to you know, some can say um, to kind of bring it full circle that Fortnite mm -hmm. emerged out of Unreal Tournament, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and it's just like a newer kind of more hopped up version of that. Um, but uh, God, this was so much fun, Kimberly. Thank you so much for your time. You've been so generous. We've gone way over an hour now. Um, her new book is Extraction. Um, it, it came out July twelfth. You know, go check it out. I'll leave all the links below. And and Kimberly, I, I I'd love to keep a dialogue open with you and maybe send you um, a beta code. Um, you know, for my game, you can download my game right into the Oculus. It's already you know I'm part of the you know Oculus ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and I I'd love to give you a little tour of what I'm trying to build. I'm I'm always happy to take a look. All right. Awesome. Awesome. I really appreciate your time, your generosity, and you know, I, I feel like I can talk to you for another few hours. This is very, very cool stuff. All thank right. you. This was a blast. Cool, cool. Well, thank you guys, everybody. Uh, Club Metaverse Podcast. We will see you all soon. All right.